so I believe that this legislation is extraordinarily important for our country. It's taken great effort on the part of many over the course of the past several months. And I want to thank the Chair of the Energy and Commerce Committee, Henry Waxman. His colleagues on that committee, including Congressman Dingell, Ed Markey, and Rick Boucher. I also want to thank Charlie Rangel, the chair of the Ways and Means Committee, and Colin Peterson. The chair of the Agriculture Committee, for their many and ongoing contributions to this process. And I want to express my appreciation to Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer for their leadership. We all know why this is so important. The nation that leads in the creation of a clean energy economy. Will be the nation that leads the 21st century's global economy. That's what this legislation seeks to achieve, it's a bill. That will open the door to a better future for this nation. And that's why I urge members of Congress to come together and pass it. The last issue I'd like to address is health care. Right now, Congress is debating various health care reform proposals. This is obviously a complicated issue but I am very optimistic about the progress that they're making. Like energy, this is legislation that must and will be paid for. It will not add to our deficits over the next decade. We will find the money through savings and efficiencies within. The healthcare system some of which we've already announced. We will also ensure that the reform we pass brings down the crushing cost of health care.
we simply can't have a system where we throw good money after bad habits. We need to control the skyrocketing costs that are driving families. businesses, and our government into greater and greater debt. There's no doubt that we must preserve what's best about our health care system. And that means allowing Americans who like their doctors and their health care plans to keep them. But unless we fix what's broken in our current system, everyone's health care will be in jeopardy. Unless we act, premiums will climb higher, benefits will erode further. And the roles of the uninsured will swell to include millions more Americans. Unless we act, one out of every five dollars that we earn will be spent on health care within a decade. And the amount our government spends on Medicare and Medicaid will eventually. grow larger than what our government spends on everything else today. When it comes to health care, the status quo, UO is unsustainable and unacceptable. So reform is not a luxury, it's a necessity. And I hope that Congress will continue to make significant progress on this issue in the weeks ahead. So let me open it up for questions, and I'll start with you, Jennifer. Q, thank you, MR. President. Your administration has said that the offer to talk to Iran's leaders remains open. Can you say if that's still so? even with all the violence that has been committed by the government against the peaceful protesters. And if it is, is there any red line that your administration won't cross where that offer will be shut off?
President Obama, well, obviously what's happened in Iran is profound. And we're still waiting to see how it plays itself out. My position coming into this office has been that the United States has core national security interests in making sure that Iran doesn't possess a nuclear weapon and it stops exporting terrorism outside of its borders. We have provided a path whereby Iran can reach out to the international community, engage. And become a part of international norms. It is up to them to make a decision as to whether they choose that path. What we've been seeing over the last several days, the last couple of weeks. Obviously is not encouraging, in terms of the path that this regime may choose to take. and the fact that they are now in the midst of an extraordinary debate taking place. In Iran may end up coloring how they respond to the international community as a whole. We are going to monitor and see how this plays itself out before we make any judgments about how we proceed. But just to reiterate, there is a path available to Iran in which their sovereignty is respected. Their traditions, their culture, their faith is respected, but one in which they are part of a larger community. That has responsibilities and operates according to norms and international rules that are universal. We don't know how they're going to respond yet, and that's what we're waiting to see. Q, so should there be consequences for what's happened so far? President Obama, I think that the international community is as I said before, bearing witness to what's taking place.
and the Iranian government should understand that how they handle the dissent within their own country. Generated indigenously, internally, from the Iranian people. will help shape the tone not only for Iran's future but also its relationship to other countries. Since we're on Iran, I know Nico Pitney is here from Huffington Post. Q, thank you, MR. President. President Obama, Nico, I know that you, and all across the internet. We've been seeing a lot of reports coming directly out of Iran. I know that there may actually be questions from people in Iran. Who are communicating through the internet? Do you have a question? Q, yes, I did, I wanted to use this opportunity to ask you a question directly from an Iranian. We solicited questions last night from people who are still courageous enough to be communicating online. And one of them wanted to ask you this, under which conditions would you accept the election of Ahmadinejad? And if you do accept it without any significant changes in the conditions there. Isn't that a betrayal of what the demonstrators there are working towards? President Obama. Well, look, we didn't have international observers on the ground. We can't say definitively what exactly happened at polling places throughout the country. What we know is that a sizable percentage of the Iranian people themselves spanning Iranian society, consider this election illegitimate. It's not an isolated instance a little grumbling here or there.
there is significant questions about the legitimacy of the election. And so ultimately the most important thing for the Iranian government to consider. is legitimacy in the eyes of its own people, not in the eyes of the United States. And that's why I've been very clear, ultimately. This is up to the Iranian people to decide who their leadership is going to be and the structure of their government. What we can do is to say unequivocally that there are sets of international norms and principles about violence. about dealing with peaceful dissent, that spans cultures, spans borders. And what we've been seeing over the internet and what we've been seeing. in news reports violates those norms and violates those principles. I think it is not too late for the Iranian government to recognize that there is a peaceful path that will lead to stability and legitimacy and prosperity for the Iranian people. We hope they take it. Jeff Mason of Reuters Q, right here, sir. Switching gears slightly, in light of the financial regulation and reform that you have made. How do you rate the performance of the Fed in handling the financial crisis? And more specifically, how do you rate the performance of Ben Bernanke? And would you like him to stay on when his term ends in January? President Obama, I'm not going to make news about Ben Bernanke although. I think he has done a fine job under very difficult circumstances. I would say that all financial regulators didn't do everything.
that needed to be done to prevent the crisis from happening. And that's why we put forward the boldest set of reforms in financial regulation in 75 years. Because there were too many gaps where there were laws on the books that would have brought about a prevention of the crisis, the enforcement wasn't there. In some cases, there just weren't sufficient laws on the books for example, with the non-banking sector. I think that the Fed probably performed better than most other regulators prior to the crisis taking place. but I think they'd be the first to acknowledge that in dealing with systemic risk and anticipating systemic risk. They didn't do everything that needed to be done. I think since the crisis has occurred, Ben Bernanke has performed very well. And one of the central concepts behind our financial regulatory reform is that there's got to be somebody who is responsible not just for monitoring the health of individual institutions. But somebody who's monitoring the systemic risks of the system as a whole. and we believe that the Fed has the most technical expertise and the best track record in terms of doing that. But that's not the only part of financial regulation. One of the things that we're putting a huge amount of emphasis on is the issue of consumer. Protection whether it's subprime loans that were given out because nobody was paying. attention to what was being peddled to consumers, whether it's how credit cards are handled. How annuities are dealt with, what people can expect in terms of understanding their 401, K, S. There's a whole bunch of financial transactions out there where consumers are not protected the way they should.
and that's why we said we're going to put forward a Consumer Financial Protection Agency whose only job it is to focus on those issues.